Welcome back, College 11, Basket. 10, 9, Ball 8, fans. 7, 6, 5, To Hoops four, HT. 3, 2, 1, hep. Oh, shit. <laughs> we are 98 days, 15 hours, 51 minutes, and 55 seconds away from the start of the 2019-20 basketball, college basketball season, as you can all see on the screen there. This is our July podcast here at Hoops HD. I'm your host, Chad Sherwood, joined by David Griggs, John Titel below me here, a small crew for this uh, yeah, a, end a of small, July. A, a small panel, a small itinerary. We might just end up with the clock on the screen for 30 <laughs> minutes counting down. I mean, it, that might be the highlight of the show. Well, well let, me tell, let me tell you, how, the way we do these shows every month that during the off season is we kind of just have an email thread out there. We, we go back and forth about what our topic is going to be what our guests going to be or whatever. And uh, as things turned out, we ended up with absolute, as of this morning, we had no itinerary, no <laughs> guests. We had nothing, David. So, right, we, uh, so David, I'm supposed to host. I got no idea. I'm going to throw it to you. What are we doing tonight? Okay. So, well, let's start out with some of the, it, it is a new year. I mean, well, granted, it's not a new year. We're about a month into the new year, but I think this is our first show of the new athletic year. So, so happy new year. And do we have some new stuff, like just some updates on the site? I, I think we do if you throw the screen share up there. We, have, um, we do? We have, what do we have? Oh, well, we've got – or maybe – The countdown eight. clock. Yeah, we've got the countdown clock. Let's let's see here. Um, is, uh, is, is it up there? Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Yeah, going through here, we've got the uh, – we, we've got the survival board. You see there's now 349 teams on it, all of them under consideration. Um, we're not removing they anyone today, I don't think. David, David, the season yeah. hasn't started yet. Everybody's okay. still alive. And then we've got the, you know, going through there. Why isn't it loading? Oh, see, there's the new selection committee. Kevin White's the chair. They've made Mitch Barnhart from Kentucky is the vice chair. Duke and Kentucky, the Palsies, those two schools added again, collaborating. What a collaboration. So uh, Mitch Barnhart, the chair for next year. Uh, what else have we updated? Um, let, let's take a look at bracketology and you see there, oh, the, the, okay. That's still the same. Can, can, can we uh, buzz this entire show? Preview? Yeah. How about the, <laughs> uh, yeah, look at that. We've, we, we've got the season previews coming in September. Uh, you know, there has been some news. Titan, let me, let me, let me bring you in here. Let's get rid of David. Um, uh, NC state, a little bit new news coming out of NC state. Uh, you're a little bit familiar with more familiar with it. I think than I am. Uh, you want to fill us in on what's been going on there? So it has certainly been a busy newsmaking scene off the court in college basketball. It seems for the past year or years um, with so many schools around the country doing all manner of bad acts. Um, the latest this month, uh, NC State received a, quote, notice of allegations from the NCAA um, alleging that they did bad stuff. And this is serious. Uh, level one, which means if they're guilty, we're talking postseason ban. We could be talking fine reducing scholarships, and this is a pretty solid team. Won, I believe, 24 games last year and made the postseason. Um, this is not just some random person from outside the family trying to go at them. They have, from the FBI trial last October, the compliance director of the Wolfpack, Kerry Doyle, testifying about some of the bad acts. There's allegations that former coach Godfrey, who had an assistant, Orlando Early, who gave almost 50 grand in bribes, to Dennis Smith and his family from the come to Raleigh. Um, to be honest, probably a good idea because Smith ended up being a lottery pick and is now a successful NBA player. But obviously, you have to recruit the guys the right way. Gottfried's long gone. He's a CSUN, but he still could be in trouble himself because if he was the one at fault or if he didn't supervise his assistant with the bribes. The funniest part to me, so they, as I said, Gottfried's long gone. The Wolfpack still owes him over a half a million dollars from his buyout. You think they're going to pay that anytime soon? <laughs> Well, well, David, we're very we're familiar with the way allegations go, especially in the state of North Carolina for the NCAA. Uh, it may not affect this year or next or the next or the next or the next. Yeah, it, it takes some time. But uh, one of the big fallouts of this, and it was alleged that there was going to be at least six schools over the summer to receive a notice of allegations, NC State the first one. And, and as Titel alluded to, it was a serious allegation. What you kind of hate to see, and I realize it's an old argument, but it's still as valid now as it was five and 10 and 20 years ago when it was being made. 
Uh, Mark Godfrey not there anymore. Uh, none of the players involved there anymore. Yet who's going to bear the brunt of this? Kevin Keats, who's at least not been accused of anything and who seems to be on the up and up, did a great job at UNC Wilmington, I think it was, and, you, you know, real solid recruited pipeline. Doing a good job at NC State. They missed the tournament last year, but they're certainly trending in the right direction. Uh, you hate to see this land in the lap of, of someone that wasn't really responsible for it, but uh, it, it, on the flip side of that, well, what are they supposed to do? Just go after the individuals, or should NC State be punished and hence the current players and coaches, even though they had nothing to do with it? Well, I th- I mean, that's the ongoing debate that's been going on for years now when, you know, when five years later, programs are being punished for things that happened that none of the current players were involved in. But, I mean, what else can you do to punish a program other than what we just talked about? So it, it's, right. it's kind of I a mean, catch-22. You, you when you look at Mark Godfrey, they could punish him mm-hmm. by making him be Mark Godfrey, but he already is Mark Godfrey. You can vacate wins. Yeah, you can vacate <laughs> wins, which means pretending you didn't win games that everyone knows you won, although in the case of NC State, it wouldn't be that many. Well, Louisville's very familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, other stuff that's been going on, uh, Titel, you've also been following this the basketball tournament. Uh, want to give us a little bit about that and the Pan Am games as well you've been following? I know. So we'll start with the TBT. We're down to eight teams left in the quarterfinals, uh, $2 million on the line. So even though it's not college basketball, it features some well-known guys in administrative and player roles. Um, the favorite has to be overseas elite. If you haven't heard of them, you must have been asleep for four years because they won the last four TBT titles for a total of $7 million. Um, it's hard to bet against these guys. They never lose. Um, some of the other com- uh, contenders, loyalty is love. You might have heard of their GM, DeMarcus Cousins. Team Hines, uh, they have Juan Dixon, former NCAA Most Outstanding Player, as their coach, who's now the coach at Coppin State. I'm not sure how his contract allows him to do this, but that's a separate issue for our lawyers. And, of course, Everline Drive. Um, a lot of these teams are composed of guys who, like, had – some success in college and then went to Europe and they just want to get in on $2 million. Everyone in drive, they have James Michael McAdoo. You might remember him from not one, but two championship teams with Golden State. Can you imagine like you go out on this court facing some random college dudes, you look and this guy's got multiple rings. I mean, there's some competition there, but my pick is still overseas elite because they never, ever lose. Uh, I do have a question about the TBT. It, it's 64 teams. It's a bracketed format. It's becoming – more and more popular every year I, and I think it just goes to show you how when you put 64 teams into a bracket it's going to attract attention but they say it's an open tournament meaning it's open to anyone now is there a selection process John or is there qualifying to get to the 64? So I think that anybody can try to apply for a team there's a Twitter component where if you get enough followers that helps you and obviously you need to have I can't just show up with like 11 of my friends and hope to make it. I mean, you need to have some talent out there, but on some level it's open in terms of it's not just like the alma mob, the alumni from the top 64 teams from last year's NCAA tournament or something. Um, it can be anybody. And I think one of the teams this year is like an eight seed. So it's not always that the Ohio States and Syracuse alumni groups always make the semifinals. There's a chance for an upset this year. Okay. Uh, Tatel, how about the Pan Am games? You following them too? So the other big news outside of college basketball, if you like basketball in the summer, you have to kind of go outside your comfort zone, and the Pan Am game is it. Two different options this year. One is the three-by-three. Three. You got Team USA led by 2011 Ivy League Defensive Player of the Year, Kareem Maddox. What is he using his Princeton degree for these days? He's at a place called Gimlet Media. He produces, you guessed it, podcasts. How about oh. that? Some producer of podcast is representing the United States of America in an international basketball competition. Maybe we should so, do that. <laughs> if I ever had to cheer for a Princeton guy, I guess it's the podcast guy, but we'll see. Um, the normal format, obviously, five by five. And so this year, instead of just picking the 12 best guys, they're going with the 12 Big East guys. I would say the best Big East guys, but I assure you they're not all the best. Um, they have some solid competitors. Miles Powell scored over 22 a game for Seton Hall. Be first team all big east this year he's going to be i think the focus of the offense you also got a guy like Luane pipkin so if you're wondering why the hell is he on the big east i don't blame you because he has never actually played a game in the big east he scored over 15 points a game at umass last year he's a grad transfer heading to providence whose head coach ed cooley is the head coach of the big east team in the pan am games i wonder how that was able to make happen hopefully he can contribute talk about a way to get in good with the rest of your big east teammates 
Um, to give you an idea, this is not something unlike the Olympics where the U.S. wins every single year. You have to go back to 1983 for the last time the U.S. won a gold medal at the Pan Am Games in basketball. Wow. You might have heard of the leading scorer the last, the last time they did it 36 years ago. He was a guard from North Carolina. I believe it's pronounced Michael Jordan. I'm not sure. Mike, Mike Kale, Mike Kale, Jordan. Yeah, he, 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 he wasn't the number one pick that year, but if I recall, he went fairly high in the draft. Uh, did he go to Chicago? I think maybe Milwaukee. I forget. Um, yeah. Anyhow, um, I, I actually, you know, speak about the, especially about the three by three on the international format. This is something we'll be talking about oh, about 12 months from now, maybe in our July podcast next year with the Olympics coming up. Uh, three by three will be in the Olympics games next year as well. Uh, David, have you seen much of this three by three game? It's kind of an interesting game. Yeah, it is interesting. I've seen enough to know basically how it works, but only basically. I think it's teams of four. Obviously, it's three on three. It's half court, and it's twenty one rules, isn't it? Like uh, you play to twenty one, or there's a time limit, and it's one point for per basket and two points for what would be a three pointer. Yeah, uh, is that the rules we're using the Pan Am also, Titel? I know there's a different set of rules. I think and there's a professional three by three uh, league out there that's slightly different rules. I, th- I think David's talking about the one that was in the three by three U games that I've been. At it, that was four. what I was talking about. Yeah. And if there's variations of rules, I don't know what they are. I Thanks think for going to me, Chad. Ask some me something I know next time. Mm-hmm. I think it's similar with some variations. We could spend ten minutes on the rules, but I assure you, we can better spend those ten minutes doing something else. Uh, I think we can as well, and, and, and quite frankly, uh, David, for the way our podcast going, I, I think this is what we should spend. We should spend the next yeah, ten minutes doing. Yeah, we've got forty-five, forty, oh, thirty-seven, thirty-six, thirty-four. This is exciting television. Well, uh, but maybe we should just leave the podcast rolling for the next ninety-eight days and fifty. Yeah, yeah, a ninety-eight-day podcast. <laughs> Uh, David, let me go to you. What, what else you got on the agenda for tonight? Well, I've got a couple more things. I, I got one in particular, uh, and this is actually sort of relevant. Uh, the NCAA just last week wrapped up its first ever youth camps. Um, and, and what this is, it's roughly 2,400 high school recruits. So of various levels, Division One and two, some Division Three. Uh, they're invited to one of four campuses. Uh, one was Grand Canyon. One was Illinois. One was somewhere in Florida, and I forget. Was the other one UConn? I think you know, so. This is more great television. We just don't have our facts lined up. But that's not important. But basically what they're the trying facts to Facts aren't important. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> what they're trying to do is essentially grant access to Division One caliber players, to college coaches. All college coaches are invited. Uh, and you can go to any one of the four you want. And I think what the vast majority of staffs did was they split their staff up and sent one – to each of the four locations or, or somebody to each of the four locations. And there's no AAU tournaments. There's no AAU coaches uh, who can go is very limited. A lot of the coaching is done by D two and D three coaches. Um, it, a lot of the drills and whatnot. So it's this rich recruiting ground. It's each location had two different camps of 300 kids. So if you do the math, that's eight of three and that's 2,400. And what I, again, it's, you know, in order to get direct access to Division One players and cutting out the AAU, and from what I've heard, it went pretty well. Some of the criticisms I've heard is that they wish the better players wouldn't have been limited, that they could have just played all the time and you could have gotten to evaluate them more. But it needs to be tweaked. But I think the feedback right away was pretty good. And is this, like, is it cold in hell? Because the NCAA had a good idea. They executed it, and the feedback was good. And the, and the reasoning was good. Uh, my only question is, should they double this? Like, should they let kids go to two different camps instead of one? And then that way you get two opportunities to access players directly without having to go through the AAU. I tell you, you got thoughts on that? You know, let's get, I mean, I, I do, I love the idea of getting rid of the AAU because I think a lot of these problems that we see kind of stem out of that AAU circuit. True. And we've seen some guys uh, who have succeeded without becoming uh, regulars on the AAU circuit. Um, I'm still not sure who benefits the most. If it's kids who are learning skill sets that will help them in college and beyond, uh, I'm all for that. And I hope everybody else is too because. Um, regardless of it, whether it's AAU or a NCAA guy or whoever, like, but teach them how to play the fundamentals of basketball. That's always a good thing. Um, if it helps somebody get an edge in recruiting, I get a little nervous or at least not happy about that. And I don't know 
with those numbers, like if you're the 300th best guy at the 300 person camp, does that mean you're only D3 good or could you sneak into an Ivy League roster? Like, I don't know how it shakes out. Well, how does it benefit if all 351 or 352 Division One schools are invited and welcome to send whoever they want to these places? Does it really give anyone a leg up in recruiting? I suppose not if it's equal for everybody, but I mean, there's a reason that Dennis Smith was not getting, I suppose he had 50,000 reasons to go to NC State, but I'm guessing he was not being looked at by the Columbia's and Cornell's of the world. Right. And the way it kind of works is, I under, and again, I didn't go, but they're divided into three categories. So it's the top 100, then the next 100, and then the next 100. And they're put on teams of, I don't know how many, six or seven, and they just continue to play. And the, the coaches can observe the play. And I think that they can observe individual instruction as well. But there is a day where the coaches are not allowed. It's, it's just work. And I don't know, from what I understand, it's just workshops and seminars like adjusting to college life, what to do, who to avoid, things like that. But all in all, at least from what I've heard from those that were there, they didn't let me in. Why, why was that, Chad? Why was I not allowed to be there? Because you're a puppet. Oh, okay. Well, what's that got to do with it? If you're on the list of who to avoid. I've got bad news for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't have anything. The AAU won't let me in either, so I don't know why I wasn't let into this. But the feedback that I heard from the people that were allowed to be there was that it was good and that, it, it you know, you didn't have to worry about getting the access or going through any back channels or getting there. And then, yeah, the game is free, but in order to get in, you have to pay $300 for this particular program. Uh, you know, it was. I think a lot of the coaches felt – it was refreshing. Now, again, uh, we'll see. I, I've heard a limited amount. We'll see what everybody else thinks. But uh, you, you kind of like this, and you kind of want to see more of it. You'll never cut out the AAU because if you want more access than the three days that this camp provides, then in order to get, you have to get it some other way, which is why I wish they would double it and let kids go to two different camps. But um, all in all, I thought it was a good idea, and amazingly, the feedback was, was good. Well, so the NCAA did something right. It is a first, uh, yeah. I guess, on that. Right. No, I think that covers everything I had on my list. So, Titel, anything else you want to discuss or any other thoughts for the night? Um, I think that is the gist. I mean, as I said, like, it's hard to find basketball stuff to talk about in July. So I think we did a good job of pushing the envelope. Um, I think there's several unanswered questions as we head into the season in terms of how does a champion replace all that Virginia lost? Um, what kind of happens with the recruiting classes that we've seen that are among the best in the country? Um, what happens with bad actors who are getting notice of allegations? So there's a lot of stuff up in the air, which is why we don't make predictions in July, because there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen between now and the start of the season. Yeah, it's, and it's going to be interesting. Uh, we'll be back here again sometime in August, sometime in September. And then when we get to October, Dave will finally be starting to talk about predictions and where things are going for the year because it'll yep. be a lot more by then but any other thoughts from you uh no just again it's kind of the dog days of summer uh what's going on is not happening on the court it's happening off of it it's hard to kind of get excited about that and, and do a good show which is why we have the clock can we put cue the clock you want the clock? Yeah. Well, I'm like, not, I can't quite go that quickly. There we go. Oh, okay. There it is. Well, I mean, that's why we have the clock. This is hugely entertaining. It's the best thing on the internet as far as college basketball goes. You can see, you, you can look at the clock day, night. You can, anytime you want to, you can come to Hoops HD and look at the clock and see how much time's left until the start of the season. Yeah, it'll be right over on the right-hand side of the screen there. We'll leave it running, in fact, constantly all the way up until zero. Yeah. Uh, probably even beyond that for all we know. Right, uh, yeah. But I what, guess what happens I, when it goes to zero? I forget. I, the game start. Oh, the game start. Okay, great, yeah. <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, I want to continue wish everybody a happy Happy summer. Enjoy the rest of the month of August, at least, the last few days here in July. Uh, but on behalf of David Briggs and John Titel, I'm Chad Sherwood, and we'll talk to you again real soon.